Well, welcome to the third session on the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Don't know about you, but my ambition when I was young and thinking about my future was not, I would love to be the most meek I could possibly be. <laughs> that wasn't top of my list of desires for my life, and I don't suppose it was for any of us, any of us here. Um, but it's so important. It's so important that we understand what Jesus is on about here because there are many misconceptions about what it means to be a Christian and in this uh, area of being meek, what that really means. And so we need to understand it the best we can um, so that we can have the best impact we can and grow to be the best we can be for God in this life, the best we can. So we're going to get into that. But first of all, I would just like to ask, does anybody want to share what's been helpful so far from last Friday? from Obi Sermon on Sunday, from other materials you might have been reading or a podcast if you've been listening to that. So far, has anything stood out to you that you've personally found and that's been helpful to me? Anything you'd like to share? Yeah. Thank you. So for me, uh, personally, uh, I'm worried about the failures, losing things. I'm always not, I'm a little bit fearful. Um, I don't want to lose anything. I don't want to go to tough times from the but uh, this um, Sunday message really helped me. Uh, now I don't worry, like, whatever comes, okay, let's, let's face it. <laughs> so if that confidence has given me, of course, God is with me, so that's a different thing. But uh, uh, what I personally understood, I don't need to fear for what is going to be happening, but whatever has come, God is there to uh, face it. So that confidence I could be able to maintain this. Amen. Thank you. God's with you. Really. Yes, yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Share. So far, um, John? I suppose, you know, whenever we, we read specifically Jesus' words, it just feels so deeply personal. Mm. So I think, um, you know, already we're sort of two weeks in and it feels like everything hits to a real heart level. Yes. Um, and I think similar to what Manny said, I think what I've noticed that I've held with me, you know, after the poor in spirit and our sermon on, uh, you know, blessed are those who mourn. Single word that comes to mind is comfort, just the comfort that we hold with us. Mm. Mm. Um, but we've got Jesus' mind, mm. mm. Thank you. Super. Rudy, you had something? Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, again, I mean, there's, there's so much that's, that we can aspire towards. Um, and I think somebody mentioned last week that even the thing is so certain amount that when you do start expecting stuff that's so far beyond us. But I think what I've learned is, is that the, the key is, is that who are in spirit is that, and, and I guess what we look at today as well, you know, this, it, it, it's, it's not about what we can achieve, it's about getting back to God always. <laughs> every time every time we feel that we're not, that we, we're not measuring up, when we feel discouraged or, or not faithful, we, it's, it's to go back to God, to realize what we are for us. No point in pretending that I have the strength to do this. It's God's strength, and, and, and that's sort of every time building us back up. That, that's like to, to, to get into the habit of going back to God, continually going back to a place of being full of spirit, mm -hmm. and let God build us up from, yes. you know, in that process. Yes, and, and that's right. And and God helping us to develop all of what that can be yes. in us. Yes. So we've been gifted a poverty of spirit. You could say we've been gifted. Yes. The, ability, the, the heart of a mourner. We've been gifted meekness, but how, how, much can, how much can I explore that? How much can I, how can I grow into that? How much, how much more of that can I be? It's rather than let me reach a standard. I mean, this is very important for the Sermon on the Mount. It's not a set of standards. Yeah. If we see it that way, it's simply a new law. Mm. And we don't live under law. But we've been gifted these things. We've been blessed with them. And the, the blessings are the first part of each verse, but also the promises, they're both blessings, and it's blessed are those who mourn, for they will be, but we've been blessed to be people who can mourn, who are weak. How much can we, how much can that be developed in us? It's part of the adventure of our discipleship mm. as we follow Christ. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, I want to say that for me, it really made me reconsider what I think are blessings. Uh. <laughs> what I, what do I, I 
that's a really good point. I mean, it's not wrong to be grateful and thankful for the many blessings we have, the things we're grateful for in life. Um, but, but these things show us the core of what it means to be blessed. Yeah. This is what it means to be blessed. These other things may be a bonuses. They're nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is the heart of it all. Our verse tonight, uh, Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And so the position of this verse uh, seems important in the set of four. You have two sets of four in the Sermon on the Mount. Most people would see it this way. And the first set of four, we have blessed the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it looks like they're interdependent, but there's a, almost a progression here. The poverty of spirit leads us to mourn. The mourning are over the state of the world, over the brokenness of things, over the fact that death still reigns, at least temporarily, and not in full in the way it used to, but still death in a sense reigns. Sin has its consequences. Um, the, 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 the gap between humanity and God that was never intended to be there. All these things we mourn over. Um, and that mourning leads us to a meekness because we, we want to be the kind of people who can live in a new way, in a different way, in our relationship with God that would be a blessing to others. And that meekness of spirit, which we'll talk more about in a moment, also helps us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The poverty of spirit, the mourning, the meekness, lead us to that place where nothing will satisfy more than God, than our relationship with him. Now we'll explore that more. That uh, must be this, this Sunday's sermon, isn't it? Yes, that's right, verse 6. So that'll be explored more on Sunday about what righteousness really is. But just to say for now, righteousness is primarily, in biblical terms, about relationship. It's about being in right relationship with God and with one another. Um, you know the phrase that people say, um, so-and-so did right by somebody. They did right by that person. It's that kind of idea that we're living in harmony with people in a way that's responsible and appropriate and honoring of them and respectful. Primarily towards God, but also towards our fellow human beings. And so that comes because of these other things. We seem to have some kind of progression here. Now, the thing about the, this particular... Um, Beatitudes, it seems the most, perhaps the most paradoxical of all of them. It doesn't seem to add up and make sense quite. You look at it and you think, I know Jesus said that, but I'm not, I don't quite see how that works. In terms of the blessing and what we inherit. Blessed are the meek, for they will in, will what? I mean, if you and I were going to write the rest of that sentence, blessed are the meek because, well, they'll learn how nice it is to be humble or something. <laughs> but blessed are the meek because they will inherit the earth. Those two things don't seem to match up, right? They don't seem to. And I think that's part of the beauty of this. I mean, the teachings of Jesus are so wonderful in lots, on lots of levels, but partly because there's so much depth and mystery in some of it that we have to live with it for a while to really understand it. Now, isn't it such a, a good thing that becoming a Christian is relatively simple? What you need to understand is relatively simple. But isn't it also a really good thing that many of the sayings of Jesus are rather uh, complex or, or deep or, or hard to fathom because then it's about not being bored in the Christian life because we're always going to be learning more about what this really means. And so I think it will take us a lifetime, some of these things. But he says that we inherit the earth. What does that really mean? Psalm 37 helps us because it looks like Jesus is quoting or has in mind Psalm 37 as he is saying this. Let's go there for a moment and uh, let me uh, put up part of the psalm here. We won't read the, the whole psalm. But it does look like he's got this in mind and this might help us to understand what he means by inheriting the earth and we'll explore this a bit more later in the class but we will touch on it here. In Psalm 37 and uh, let's say from verse 10 I'll read from here. Verse 8 I'll read from. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. So this is a promise to the people of Israel. You will inherit the land. Verse 10, a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. So it's partly about the land, it's partly about their experience, it's partly about their state of being and their, their relationship with God. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. 
And so the oppression, there seems to be an oppression theme here, which goes back to the first beatitude about being poor in spirit. There's an idea there of, of being uh, in need, of being oppressed, of being marginalized. And so there's the same idea, that it, this happened to the Israelites, didn't it, from time, time and time again, uh, when their enemies overcame them or oppressed them. And what God is saying is, well, that's temporary. There's going to come a time when I'm going to have the victory and you're going to share it. And so I, I think overall what Jesus is talking about here, and of course talking to a Jewish audience at the time, when they hear him talk about the meek, what they're hearing him say is, you're in need, you are oppressed, you don't have all that you could have that God designed you to have, but the day is coming when it's all going to be yours. And it's more than just a territory. It's more than just the promised land, which of course the Jews came into, and Jesus is standing in the promised land, but he's saying you're going to inherit more. There's more than this. Because there was always more. When God promised the Jews a land, it wasn't just the land. It was the relationship. It was the fullness. It was the shalom of God was going to be theirs if only they would obey him. Now the law, the old covenant law, had limits to how they were going to experience that. And that's why I pointed forward to a new covenant, a covenant not written on tablets of stone, but written on the heart, where those who would obey him, would obey God, would obey God, not because of a set of laws, but because of a changed heart. That heart that's talked about in Jeremiah and talked about also in Hebrews. That changed heart would be the, the experience of the people of Israel. And then they would experience a relationship with God that was deeper and more intimate than could possibly be imagined under the old covenant. And that would lead us even forward to the day when there would be a new heaven and a new earth, which we'll talk more about when we get to the end. But the point being here, that when we hear of meek, we think they're not very impressive. And indeed, these people were not in an impressive situation but what, the, what they would have been hearing is there's something exciting coming. God is going to act. God is going to move. And that puts us in mind also the context of Matthew 4 and 5 here. Because in Matthew 4, uh, Jesus has come into the wilderness. He's been tested by the devil. He's resisted that. And then he begins to preach. And his message that he preaches uh, is verse four, uh, 17 of chapter 4. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so again as an Israelite you're hearing that. You're thinking, oh my goodness. Messiah is coming, the, the promised one like Moses. And then he calls his first disciples, the, uh, the fishermen, and, and a few others. And they follow, they leave the boat on the nets and they follow him. And then he goes around at the end of chapter 4 there, uh, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. So he's dealing with the meek in this context. Those who are sick and need healing are the meek. They are in need. He's dealing with the meek who don't have the good news. Now they have the good news. He's teaching in the synagogues, but they, they need to know this message. And he heals them, those suffering from severe pain, the demon-possessed, having seizures, the paralyzed. He heals them, and as a result, what happens? Large crowds come, come along from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan. They follow him, and they follow him up this mountain where he now is. And up there, when he sees the crowds, he goes there, sits down, his disciples come to him, and I don't think there is the twelve, because he hasn't selected the twelve yet, right? So his disciples more in a broader sense. So those who are currently following him come to sit at his feet. And part of what's going on here is he's saying, if you want to follow me, and I'm proclaiming the good news, and I'm healing the sick, and I'm helping the meek all around me, if you really want to be the meek, you need to understand this. Because if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to inherit all that's promised, you need to understand what it's going to take. And, Ra, uh, and I, I don't know how they all felt about it, but you can imagine, you can understand why, like in John 6, when there are a lot of people following him and he teaches them some hard stuff, it says like, they all left. You know, this is for those who are going to be serious about following Jesus. And part of what he's doing is refining them. He's giving them great promises, but finding, not just in the Beatitudes, of course, but all the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll, we'll come to in time. So, this is part of what's going on. Let's talk a bit about what it means to be meek. Meek, the Greek word praps, meaning gentle, humble, considerate, courteous, all the qualities you want in a potential son-in-law. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is what it means to be meek. You'll notice the word weak is not uh, in there. Gentle, humble, considerate, courteous. Good words. The word is used other times in the New Testament. Here are some examples from 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. By the humility, and that's translated humility, that's the word praus, it's translated meek in Matthew 5. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, Paul says. 
In Galatians 5.22, one uh, part of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness and self-control. That's meek, so meekness and self-control. In Colossians 3 verse 12, as God's holy uh, chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, the word prouse again. Clothe yourselves with meekness and patience. Uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 15, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with meekness, perhaps, and respect. And uh, we'll maybe come back to the James uh, scripture if we have time. So this is what meekness is and how it's expressed. Now, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 in Luke chapter 4 when he's talking about his mission, about coming to help uh, people. And in but that passage back in Isaiah 61 says that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And the word poor there is the word meek. So the good news is coming to the meek. And uh, Psalm 37 and Isaiah 61 were recognized in the days of Jesus as messianic. This is the kind of thing the Messiah was going to come and do. This is amazing news. But the amazing news is not coming to the strong. The amazing news is not coming to those in established positions of power and authority and of uh, good fortune in the eyes of the world. This great, wonderful news is coming to those who are meek. Coming to those who are meek. So, do we have time? Maybe we do. Let's go to Isaiah 61 for me. Turn in your Bible with me to Isaiah 61. I would just love to read a bit of this with you. Uh, I just I find this so inspiring. Because this is in the background of the thinking of Jesus and of the Jewish people that would have heard him speak uh, at that time. Isaiah 61. So, so read this, as we read this, think about how you would have felt hearing Jesus effectively say, this is the time that's talked about here in Isaiah. In Isaiah 61, this, uh, verse 1, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken heart. Proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Wow. Just, you know, this is, this is the message of what Jesus is saying to the people listening to him is this, this is coming true. The kingdom is here. Everything's about to change. And as we listen to that, it's so important that we remember that this is not just a nice saying. Like it's a thing to remember, blessed and me, but they will inherit the earth. It's a nice saying. It's about a complete change in our lives that's already happened but continues to be happening as we grow in Christ. Such that we, we are so different from the world. Not because we're trying to be different. Like, look at me, I'm different. It's, it's not because of that, it's because the way that the Spirit transforms us into understanding this and living it, that the world can't help but notice. Which of course
because it leads to the persecution that he says we should rejoice over later, but we're coming to that later. <laughs> but that, that happens because of these changes that happen to us. So, let's think about Jesus for a minute here. Was Jesus gentle, humble, considerate, and courteous? No, he was more than that, but he was definitely that, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle, and as the word prouse, I am meek, and humble in heart, you will find rest for your souls. And it says of him in Matthew 21, Say to daughter, Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle. Again, the word prouse, hump meek, and riding on a donkey. Said of, as an Old Testament passage, but said now and applied to Jesus, coming on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus was, what I, the way I think about meekness, as a summary of meekness in my mind is, it's a combination of gentleness and gentleness and strength. Gentleness of spirit and strength of spirit, which don't really go together often. There's a gentleness, humility, and a strength. Was Jesus weak? No. But was he soft? No. Was he harsh? No. I mean, he said a few harsh things sometimes that were true, but he wasn't harsh, but he was strong. I, I find this... If this was the only verse we looked at, the Beatitudes, I would think it was all, this whole series was worthwhile for me. I don't know why, but there's something about this quality in Jesus that I admire perhaps as much as any of his qualities. This ability to be meek, to be gentle, and to be strong. I struggle with both of those, depending you know, at my time in life and who I'm with and the circumstances. And I think probably most of us have a, a balance more on being strong at being stronger being gentle rather than stronger being strong, or vice versa, as some of us are more wired up to be strong people but not so gentle, and some of us are more wired up to be more gentle and not so strong, and that's kind of okay, we're not meant to be exactly the same. But there's something in Jesus that shows, that, that, that he shows us what it means to be both, gentle and strong. You think about the people you love to follow, whether it's in church or not, you know, people you admire, the people you admire, and I'm talking about here that you admire and you know that they, they've got something meaningful that they've achieved with their lives, and that they've done it over the long haul. I'm not talking about somebody who's, who's a flash in the pan, but over a long period of life. You, you, I would suggest that if you really think about it, they combine, on some, to some good degree, these combinations of being gentle, considerate, and strong. You don't seem to achieve anything of great value, of lasting value, without gentleness and strength. Strong people without gentleness are arrogant and harsh and distance you. But gentle people without strength don't have any impact. Gentleness and strength. You know, Jesus said to Peter when they were in the garden, and Peter pulls out his sword and chops off the chap's ear. There's Peter being strong, right? Not, not very gentle. But Jesus says, no, put the sword away. See, Jesus could use a sword, I think. I think if he had to, Jesus would know how to use the sword, but he didn't use it. Uh, I heard someone say that meekness is um, it's like the kind of person who knows how to use a sword, but keeps it sheathed. But they know how to use it. And if they had to, they would. But they keep it to their side. There's something about Jesus that's quite amazing. In, in this area. How does Jesus display his meekness? What would you say? Any thoughts? How does Jesus show his meekness? Yes. Oh, I think the woman at the well is just an example of the first of all the fact that you know he seems to be speaking to her anyway um, and just the way he handles all that and, you know gets his point across but with such such a gentle yeah. way. And, and I think it's it's clearly he must have been because she responds by calling him sir. You know, there's mm -hmm. this yeah. there's a respect, gentleness but yeah. respect, yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he also, you know, cuts the chest. Well, he's very direct at what he needs to be. Yeah. John Ford, woman of the well. Good example, yeah. Uh, Mum. The adulterous woman, like he's quite strong with the Pharisees, mm -hmm. but he demonstrates gentleness with that. Yeah. Excellent, John A. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. There's a nice 
blend of yeah. both. It's not one or the other, it's, yeah. it's blend of both. Mm -hmm. Any other examples? Good thinking. Gentleness. Trial before yeah. pilot. Don't you know I could call on my father and yeah. I could, yeah. but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of humour in there too. Yeah. 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 He did not. Yeah, good example. I think it is gentleness with uh, when the woman's wiping his feet with her hair and tears mm -hmm. uh, at Simon's house and. Uh, I think it's worth doing the, uh, one more, yeah. Yeah, like uh, when a, a woman was caught in adultery, like when everybody wants to stone her, but she mm. was very comfortable and she did not condemn her, but rather he said that. Right, neither do I condemn you, he said, right? But, go and leave your life of sin. So there was some strength there as well, right? There's many strong yeah. Pharisees. I think it, was, it may be a fruitful Bible study to skim through the Gospels and look at Jesus with people and ask yourself, is he being gentle, is he being strong? Where is he being both? And what could you learn from that? Mm -hmm. Think about your own life and the, and the places in which you have some conflict and where you could, up, you could offer more gentleness in some of that conflict and sometimes you could offer more strength. Yeah. Or maybe both. Some good Bible study to do there. And I think I've made a suggestion of this on the sheep. Moses is another a good Bible study for this because he was known as the most humble man, the most meek man, right? So uh, there's a lot of examples in his life where he operated, or he offered both, sometimes gentleness, sometimes strength. So you've got, you've got a lot of that together there as well. Okay, we need to press on because time is always against us. Um, what does meekness look like? I would suggest passages which I've given you the uh, references on the handouts, so you can look at them more later. But uh, meekness looks like spiritual security. Being secure in our spiritual state, our relationship with God, that God loves us and everything's okay. I mean, everything in life might not be okay, but everything's okay because we're okay with God, right? Um, I think it looks like that, like Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, about the, his endurance, his troubles, his hardships, his beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights and hunger and all that. I mean, incredibly tough stuff. Um, Beaten yet not killed, sorrowful, always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. <laughs> having nothing yet possessing everything. That is a state of spiritual security from which we can be meek. I have nothing and I have everything. I mean, that's kind of a Christian. We have nothing. Because nothing, nothing we have is really of any real value. Because it's not going with us, right, to the next flight. And so we have nothing, nothing, but we have everything. They have that security because of that. Um, or passages like 1 Peter 2. Uh, we're able to live like this. How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it's commendable before God. Uh, because Christ suffered for you. So he uses the example of Jesus to inspire us to not fight for our rights. But to endure suffering um, when, when it comes. We can bear up under undue, unjust treatment by following the example of Christ. And we trust God to take care of justice issues that we can't right ourselves. Don't repay evil for evil. This is a meek position. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's a, that's a, um, that's a, a gentleness thing, I suppose. Do not take revenge, dear friends. It sells Hollywood films, but that's not how you're meant to live. 
Leave room for God's wrath. It's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, will he burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. So there's a gentleness and a strength there. Because to be not overcome by evil means you've got to have an inner strength. right? That's spiritual security. But you don't react with the strength. You react with the gentleness. But you have the strength within. Overcome evil with good. We trust God to take care of these things. Uh, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves, who live meekly, will be exalted. I see in this also, part of the way in which God prepares us to be useful, or we're enabled to be useful for God to be lifted up and used, is by adopting a meek spirit. The more meek we become, the more useful we are to God, because He can lift us up and direct us, rather than we direct ourselves into our usefulness for the kingdom of God. It comes because God lifts us up as we grow in our humility. What does meekness look like? It looks like concern for other people. In Galatians 6 verse 1, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person prousely. That's the word meek there. Gently. It takes strength to take the initiative, but it takes gentleness to be effective, to help somebody. All right? So in our fellowship, we are called to help each other, yeah. even with sin. And to talk about sin with each other takes some boldness. Strength. But to do it with the right spirit means we can actually help one another. Both strength and gentleness. How do we develop meekness? Well, that's a whole other class which we haven't got time for tonight. I would encourage us to talk about this together. In our, uh, uh, between our spouses, uh, in our family groups, in our, in our friendships. Let's talk about how can we develop meekness. We actually have it because God's given it to us by the power of His Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, part of it, is meekness. right? So we have it. How can we live into it fully? Will be a good thing for us to uh, discuss and uh, and contemplate. Let's finish by talking briefly about what he means to inherit the earth a little more. Inherit the earth, the kingdom. Okay, the kingdom. Well, let's talk more about it another time. But the kingdom life is part of universal life of the universal kingdom. In one sense, everything that God made is His and is is part of His kingdom. But the kingdom life is a subset of that, which you could see as, if you like. Uh, within that, or you could see as being a slice of that. So he's talking about the kingdom life. When he's talking about inheriting the earth, he's talking about everything to do with the way that the kingdom is meant to be, and that we pray for in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer, uh, kingdom come, as uh, may your will be done on this earth. So that's what we're praying about, and that's what he's talking about, is that coming. And um, so the, if you, try, it's very difficult to do diagrams to make any sense of this, but you could look at it as a bit like this, where um, we have the kingdom coming in its, um, in its full presence in, in, a, in, a, in a very visible way with Jesus and his power being displayed. And this is God's kingdom coming to be visible amongst humankind. But then, of course, that will end and, and the world will end. And then there will be the fullness of the kingdom that comes after that. That we will live in a new heaven and a new earth. We will uh, be in a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, we will not be strumming harps on a cloud. <laughs> Neither will be just simply just sitting there singing all the time. I mean, I, I know Revelation kind of gives you that idea, and it'll be <laughs> wonderful to do that, but, but that's only a slice, and anyway, it's apocalyptic language, it's picture language, and it, it'll be a lot, we'll be living in a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to inherit uh, something that looks a bit like this. I don't know that it'll look exactly like Woking and uh, Florian Montague School, exactly, but we're going to be living with God. What are we inheriting? A new, at the next earth. I saw a new heaven, a new earth, the first heaven, the first earth passed away, no longer any sea. We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. There's no sin, right? Uh, what are we inheriting? Uh, Matthew 19, Jesus uh, talked about it. When the renewal of all things happens, Son of Man sits in his glorious stones. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There are going to be things to do in, in, on this uh, next earth. And we're going to inherit everything that we've been promised a hundred times. First will be last, last will be first. What are we inheriting? Uh, well, we have nothing, but we possess everything. In Philippians 4, this is a good theme verse for, for, to live by. I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living or plen in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. But that strength comes to the meek. You won't get that contentment without meekness. It 
comes because of that strain. Clothe yourselves with humility. God opposes the proud, shows faith to the humble. This is the spirit of the word. Okay, I do have one more thing I want to do is to finish. We've got a little over time, but I hope you forgive me with this. On, on the longer handout of the notes at the back, you'll see the words to a song called Meekness and Majesty. It's an older song by Graham Kendrick. I want to play it for you, and then you can uh, listen or you can follow along with the words and think about the meaning of these words as we uh, wrap up with this. Meekness and Majesty. Oh, yeah. Thanks everybody, I hope that's helpful.